Oh, a stunning report from Fox News' Catherine Herridge tonight. Documents showing that Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein threatened to subpoena emails, phone records, and other documents belonging to members of the House Intel Committee. Attorney General Jeff Sessions came to Rosenstein's defense earlier tonight. I'm confident that uh, uh, Deputy Rosenstein, 28 years in the Department of Justice, uh, did not improperly threaten anyone on that occasion. Uh, but uh, we do believe that we have tried to be uh, cooperative with them and made progress in, the, in months as, as the months have gone by and, in fact, have had some good relationships with top members of Congress. With the war between the DOJ and Congress heating up, two lawmakers join us tonight to make a major announcement exclusively on the angle. Here are Oversight Committee members Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan. Jim, what do you think about what uh, you just I'm, heard from the Attorney General? You're almost flabbergasted. I, I mean, wh what is the Attorney General saying? Rod Rosenstein hasn't complied with Devin Nunes' uh, subpoena, hasn't complied with Chairman Goodlatte's subpoena. We've caught them hiding information in the struck page text messages, redacting the fact that Peter Strzok was friends with Judge Contreras, one of the FISA court judges. They tried to hide that from us. And today we learn in Catherine's report that the head of the, in, in essence, the head of the Justice Department, Rod Rosenstein, was threatening members of the House Intelligence Committee for doing their job, for trying to get answers for the American people, and the Attorney General says, that's okay, we're doing just fine. I, I don't, I just, I didn't know he had said that when you just played that. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is, this report of Catherine is unbelievable. When you have the head of the Justice Department, Rod Rosenstein, saying he's going to go after staff members, emails and communications. Going after your, he wants your Blackberry. We are doing our constitutional duty as what, the, well, what, uh, Mark, that's scary. Yeah, Mark, uh, Congressman Meadows, what I think he's saying is that if you guys hold him in contempt, he's going to have to defend himself. And part of the defense will be, he wants discovery. He wants to know you who know, you've uh, been I, talking to, who you've been talking to. He wants to know your text messages. You know, you're going to I mean, maybe they won't redact your uh, documents like they, they did the well, page struck text. Right. There's two problems with yeah. it, Laura. One is, is that we're a separate branch of government. Yeah. They don't have the right to do that unless we've, we're coming under some kind of criminal investigation. And for the attorney general to say he's confident that that Rod Rosenstein did everything right. Oh well, I'm confident he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, I'm here to tell you we're we're fed up with it. Uh, we've been working on a resolution. We've got a resolution here tonight uh, that we're putting the finishing touches on. We plan to file that tomorrow. But but really, it's well, what all, is it? What's it's resolution? all about compelling DOJ to turn over documents so that we can do proper oversight. You know, if they have nothing to hide. Turn over yeah. the documents. Jim's exactly right. This is, is just inexcusable. Okay, so what, what happens? That is a resolution to compel mm -hmm. the production of documents. Haven't you already been... Well, we've subpoenaed them already. Yeah. And, and so what's, what is that it. resolution? Tell us what it is. We, we, we're, we're putting together a resolution we would frankly like to, to bring to the full House and have the House vote on. It's one thing for us to say. It's one thing for Chairman to subpoena. It's another thing if the House of Representatives would actually go on record and say, Mr. Rosenstein, we as the House, a majority of the House say, you're not giving us the information we, we need. And frankly, now that we have found out that you were threatening members of the committee staff, a standing committee in they the House of Representatives. They said it's for his defense. He's going to defend himself against your threaten, threatening to call him in contempt. This, well, Laura, let me just say How this. does he defend himself if, if he, he can't get If he wants to defend discovery? himself, let's come on right uh, tomorrow night. Let's let Rod Rosenstein come on with Jim and I. We'll lay out the facts. He can lay out his talking points. I've invited him on the show. It, many well, times. It, and you know why he doesn't come on? Is they'd rather do uh, private press releases to spin the narrative at midnight and try to act like they're complying. Listen, we've had a, a document out since November 3rd of last year asking for documents. We still don't have them. We have less than 60% of those is, documents. Is, is this draft with. that you have, um, is it going to call for his removal? What, what is this? No, it just calls for them to really what produce the document. It? What if they give you Well, the, you know, obviously, them? well, they've been doing that all along. So if they do it again, then, it's, then, then, then you at least have at the House spoken and say, we want this information. And if they then don't what? comply with it, what then, do? then everything's still on the table. The same issues are still on the table. Contempt and those, uh, those, those uh, remedies are still on the table. But we're, we're like, look, let's have the House make a, let's have the House take a vote and send a message that a majority of the House agrees with us that you should, 
You should give us information we as a separate and equal branch of government are entitled to get to get answers for are the Are we American talking people. impeachment of uh, the deputy well, I mean, Trump obviously general? that's still something we have in our toolbox, but we will have a vote. I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight, Laura, I tell the, your viewers, we're going to have a vote on the House floor one way or another. We're going to have a vote, and we're going to make sure that we get those documents. Rod Rosenstein last month called this extortion, basically. He will not give in to these demands. How about extortion when you're threatening members of a standing committee, the House of Representatives, for doing their job? We know these individuals. I know who these guys are. They work their tail off. These are the guys who helped put together that, that, that memo which talked about what went on at the FISA court and the fact they didn't tell the FISA court who paid for the dossier. They didn't tell the FISA court that Christopher Steele had been fired by the FBI for leaking information. These are the guys who put that together and they're being threatened by Rod Rosenstein. This is as wrong as it gets. What is your uh, general thought on the constitutionality of this whole investigation? I mean, we've talked about this generally before. Uh, there are a lot of scholars who believe in Dershowitz is in, and a bunch of us have been you know, talking about this for months, that this entire special counsel seems like an unconstitutional undertaking. There's no real uh, oversight. Uh, they, they essentially have a limitless budget, even though Congress appropriates. It seems like they have a limitless budget. Well, they budget. do have a limitless budget. And the president really can't remove them, supposedly, because it's bad for politics. So is there really any yeah, executive he, branch oversight country, if Rod Rosenstein yeah. himself is conflicted? As he's, he's a witness? Well, basically. he should recuse himself. I can tell you, just based on some of the facts we've seen, he should recuse himself. But th that aside, in this country, you investigate crimes. You don't go in and start to yeah. investigate and see what you can find and, and hope to come up with a crime uh, you know, after you've investigated. And that's not the way this special counsel is doing it. And I think it's wrong. Didn't, that, didn't he say he was going to make the documents available to the so-called Gang of Eight? That's supposed to happen tomorrow, but we'll see. Every time they say they're going to do something, they wind up not doing it or partially doing no, it. No, their press release it. said they were going to do yeah. it today. Oh, it was and today. It, it was Tuesday. Gonna, and now, now it's going to happen Thursday. Well, what is Gowdy and, and Ryan saying? Are they supporting him, McCarthy? Where, where, where are the leadership? Yeah, where we, are they? We, we had discussions All with the Speaker and Gowdy. Uh, where in, are they? In fact, this evening. On this. Well, I, I think they want to give more here. time. They're yeah, nervous They want to give more time. But, but the facts are on our side is, is how long is long enough? And I'm saying today is long enough. Justice delayed is justice denied, perhaps. <laughs> well said. Well said. Um, thanks for coming on today. Thank you. Thank really you, Laura. appreciate it. Up next, Attorney General Jeff Sessions just reversed an Obama-era policy that promoted migration from Latin America. He's here to talk about it and also to respond to a remarkable new story. Fox News is reporting Rod Rosenstein, Deputy AG, threatened Republicans on the House Intel Committee. That's next. Attorney General Jeff Sessions occasionally endures Twitter criticism from his boss, but that has not frozen him into inaction. Just yesterday, the Attorney General reversed an Obama-era policy that granted asylum to migrants who claimed they feared gang violence or domestic violence in their home countries. It turns out the overwhelming majority of those applications were false. The Attorney General joins us tonight. Mr. Attorney General, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you, Tucker. So I want to ask you about this, but first I have to ask about a piece of breaking news our Catherine Herridge uh, just has out saying that in January of this year, January 10th, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein went up to the Hill, met with Republican members of the House Intel Committee, had a dispute with them and threatened them with a subpoena of their emails uh, and phone records. This is what one of them said. I read it as a not so veiled threat to unleash the full prosecutorial power of the state against us. DOJ on background has confirmed that something like that did happen. What is what is that about? Well, I don't know that they've confirmed that exactly. Uh, in fact, uh, the FBI director, the senior ethics attorney for the Department of Justice who was in the room say that's a mischaracterization really of what occurred. And it also, I think, indicates that uh, there's been a br breakdown of relationships when, in fact, uh, um, since January, a great deal of progress has been made. We understand in this department that we are accountable to uh, the president, we are accountable to Congress, and we need to be cooperative with them to produce as many documents as rationally and legally and properly as can be produced to produce them, and uh, we've made tremendous progress in that regard, really. Did, did the deputy, uh, deputy attorney general threaten to subpoena the email or phone records of members of the House Intel Committee? 
Well, I was not in the room, and I can't speak to uh, what occurred. All I can say is that uh, the people at the, Chris Ray, the director of the FBI, and our senior ethics attorney was there and others, and uh, did not see it in that same fashion. Okay, so as a factual matter, you don't think that that happened? I'm, I'm confident that uh, uh, Deputy Rosenstein, 28 years in the Department of Justice, uh, did not improperly threaten anyone on that occasion. Uh, but uh, we do believe that we have tried to be uh, cooperative with them and made progress in, the, in months as, as the months have gone by and, in fact, have had some good relationships with top members of Congress. Okay. Uh, so you made news recently by undoing an Obama-era rule about asylum seekers. Give us the overview. I think most Americans like the idea that this would be a haven for people suffering around the world. Lots of people claim asylum. What do we know about the veracity of their claims? That's a good question. Uh, seven years ago, 5,000 people were applied for asylum, uh, claiming a credible fear of being at home in their home country and they needed to flee that country. Uh, that number jumped to 94,000 uh, in just seven years. Uh, it's overwhelming our system. Uh, over 80 percent of those claims are being denied by the immigration judges as being uh, not meritorious. So it is a big problem for us, but it's, it's, each one of those is requiring trials and factual dis decisions by our judges. We're going to add a hundred judges, and that may not yet be enough judges to handle the cases. We need to give the judges better guidance. They need to go back to the fundamental principles and laws and rules of the um, uh, Immigration and Nationalization Act. And if we do that, then uh, we're in a position where some of these cases can be promptly decided. You do not get to come to America if you have a private threat or a, someone personally attacks you. You do not get to uh, have asylum for that. It's based on your race, your religion, your nationality, that you're part of some special identifiable group that's being persecuted in your home country. That's what it takes to have an asylum, and we need to get this straight, and I think it will help us. Uh, the decision I made, I believe it's right legally. I'm totally confident it's consistent with the intent of the drafters of the INA, our law, and I believe it will help us uh, manage our caseloads better and give more focus to the people who deserve to be given asylum and help us uh, eliminate those that are not worthy of this asylum. Well, if over 80% of the applications are fraudulent, there's obviously a problem. So the DOJ has also recently weighed in on the question of speech on campus. What can the federal government do, the Department of Justice do, to ensure that people's First Amendment rights are protected? And why is it, why is it taking until 2018 to get DOJ involved in this? It's one of the big challenges of our time. I have come to believe, and it's almost unbelievable, that major colleges and universities would be taking action that restrict the right of free speech on a college campus. It's just got to be confronted. We have the authority under law to file a statement of, of interest in an ongoing litigation. So cases are being filed against the universities by students who complain, and if we think their complaints are meritorious, then uh, we can file a statement of interest joining with them and explaining why we at the Department of Justice think thinks these uh, concerns are real and justified and a, a court relief is appropriate. So uh, we've had some success. We've had two cases where uh, there's been a major change in the college and university's actions and two cases where the judge has um, dismissed uh, or, fail, or rejected a motion to dismiss these cases by the universities and allowing the trials to go forward. But we think it's a very important thing. Uh, students should be participating in robust debate. Uh, they ought yep. not to be uh, intimidated. Uh, they ought not to be driven by political correctness to where you can't even speak up in class, class or on campus.
It's just amazing what an upside down world it is when a conservative attorney general is defending the First Amendment against liberals. It's like things have changed almost too much. Mr. Attorney General, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good to be with you.